So it's supposed to want, a book yes, isn't yes. a book. A book isn't paper. Yes. It, it, that, that's, your, that's your memory. That's your perception of the book. It's a portal. Yes. And, and, and you know, one of the ideas, the postmodern idea, is that, well, there's no canon. And if there is a canon, it's only there to support the tyrannical patriarchy, because, of course, the tyrannical patriarchy is the explanation for everything. But I've been trying to solve that problem technically. With the, I have a small staff that's trying to produce an educational system online. And we've been trying to understand, well, what is it that makes a book canonical? There's actually a technical answer to that. So you imagine that books exist in relationship to one another. That's a perfectly reasonable postmodernist claim, by the way. Books exist in relationship to one another. Okay, well, some books have hardly any relationship to other books. Those are trivial books. Now, they might be undiscovered works of genius. That's another possibility if they're recently written. But it doesn't matter because you can't separate the wheat from the chaff at present. It's too difficult. There's too much chaff. But if you go back into the past, you can rank order books by the degree to which they've influenced other books. So it's like citations in some sense. And the books that have influenced the largest number of other books are the canonical books. And the ultimate canonical book in the West is clearly the biblical corpus because it's influenced virtually everything. And so you have to know it because it's implicit in everything else. And so you start there and so you have that. You, you have that knowledge, at least to some degree. And it gives you the foundation, the metaphorical foundation, the conceptual foundation, the mythical foundation that you can use to then well, then maybe you can now that now Shakespeare opens up to some degree and now Milton opens up to some degree and Dante opens up to some degree and you think well why should those open up and the answer is well as the social constructionist claim you're at least in part a historical creature well then those books are about you they're the the patterns in those books are the patterns of your perceptions and your actions and without understanding them, then you don't know who you are and you can't guide yourself properly through life. And so you, you, you come into university and you encounter experts and they say, look, this is canonical. Why? Because it's had a disproportionate influence on everything else. So you need, there's something here that you need to know about because it's about you. And, and it isn't about the you that's here now in some sense, it's about the you that can unfold across time in the, in the best possible way. So each of those works is a call to adventure. Every painting that's a great painting or a building like the King's Chapel, if that's not a call to adventure, I mean, what else could it be? We, we were talking about that. So these ancient buildings, these great ancient buildings that Europe is littered with, these were, people were, were aiming at something beyond themselves, beyond the span of their lifetime. They, they engaged in the, co the collective manifestation of these great works to aim, to, to, to participate in aiming something that, at something that was beyond them. It was a divine aim. They had the, the will to produce this beauty that transcended centuries. You know, and maybe the will that produces beauty is always aligned with that which transcends centuries. Maybe those are the same things. I mean, even paintings, oil paintings, you know, they, they take a moment in time and they cast it into a permanent form that can be that can be preserved across centuries. And so there's something about there's something about the establishing a relationship with eternity that's key to the construction of something that's beautiful. And then that in itself becomes a call to a relationship with with eternity.